Father, we're thankful for this day before Christmas where the world seems to, at least for a moment, remember the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, help us to take that into the world, to not make it just an annual event, but to proclaim the good news of a risen Savior that gave his life as an atoning sacrifice for our sins so that through him, Father, we might have eternal life with you. And it's through Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> I've kind of let you into my mind every once in a while about, you know, messages and what inspired me. Um, sometimes it's just very random. This one happened to be inspired with an email from Neil because Neil thought that maybe reading from Luke chapter 2 would be quite good for today, which it is. And then he would tie it into the Lord's Supper, which he did quite well. So thank you, Neil. And so I thought, you know what? I'll develop a lesson on Luke chapter 2, and that way you can all leave here Luke chapter 2 saturated. Now, <clears throat> I will tell you, as just a complete um, acknowledgement, my spin on shepherds is not necessarily shared by everyone. There are some theologians who believe that shepherds were not the misfits that you'll hear me kind of characterize them about, but instead were very beloved blue-collar workers, and that could very well be true. What I hope you don't miss, regardless of your position on the issue of shepherds, is how the misfit might apply to you. So again, taken from Luke chapter 2, a bit of a repeat, verses 8 through 12. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, don't be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Now, most everyone has heard this passage before, even if you've never even cracked open a Bible. That's because each December, in between scenes of the Grinch, slithering through Whoville, or George Bailey being rescued by Clarence, or Rudolph the red-nosed reindeer running around the North Pole with Herbie, we have Linus, who discovers the true meaning of Christmas in the Gospel of Luke. Now, I love Linus as much as anyone, but it got me to wondering whether maybe popular culture has made this story just a little too familiar. And my conclusion was, yeah, maybe it has. You see, the story begins with God sending out a birth announcement. In fact, there's only one announcement of Christ's birth that's even recorded in all of Scripture. And there's only one invitation from God to anyone to come see his newborn son. And God gives FedEx the wrong address. He sends the announcement overnight to a bunch of uneducated, smelly, low-class, social, and religious dropouts. Shepherds. They're kind of the last people that you would expect God to have on his mailing list. I mean, they were the religious outcasts of their day. According to Jewish law, shepherds were always religiously unclean because their line of work kept them from going to church. Okay, but without them... Who was going to watch the sheep while everyone else 
made the trip to Jerusalem to make sacrifices at the temple. But that didn't matter, apparently. They were doing the dirty work so that the churchy people could pretend to be holy in temple. They were kind of like truckers, maybe, or night shift workers whose jobs keep them from regularly being able to attend services. It wasn't their fault, but who cares if you're one of the pretty people? Shepherds were also social outcasts. They were constantly on the move, and they were viewed with, let's say, extreme suspicion. Kind of like how some people are biased against maybe gypsies or carnies, you know, at the carnival. They were often accused of thievery, and they weren't allowed to testify in court because their word was considered untrustworthy. And that's just a polite way of calling shepherds pathological liars. Making matters worse, they had more contact with sheep than they had with people. They didn't even come home at night because they're with the sheep 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Worse yet, they sleep in the sheep pen to guard their sheep from being thieved or attacked. In other words, you probably wouldn't want your daughter marrying a shepherd. So imagine you're God and you want to announce the most amazing, most incredible, most joyous news ever. An event that will change the course of human history. The birth of a Savior for whom the nation of Israel had been waiting and hoping and praying for thousands of years. So, to whom do you announce this enormous event? Who do you tell? Who do you invite to come and see God's only begotten son? Uh, probably not the shepherds. The point is that you would expect an event like the birth of Jesus Christ to be announced to the most important people in the world, right? You know, the political, the religious, the military leaders, the hoi polloi in society, even the media, maybe. But none of them got the text or the email or the tweet or the whatever. Oh, some foreign wise guys figured it out by following a star to Bethlehem and then they informed Herod of what they had heard. But they didn't get an angelic messenger or an angel choir or even an invitation. Only the social and religious outcasts got the memo. And it would be like the Mormon Tabernacle Choir rehearsing all year to perform Handel's Messiah in front of some skid row dropouts. Why? Why did God send his angels to announce the birth of Christ to a bunch of misfits? Were the shepherds especially pious? Were they maybe unusually holy? I mean, maybe they got the MVP for believers since they'd been locked out of church by the church police. Or maybe they were expecting this thing to happen. Or maybe they were part of the Occupy Grasslands movement. Yes, that's it. That's why. The truth is, they probably thought that God had no idea who they were. And why would he? They don't sacrifice at the temple. They don't show up for the feasts. They don't go to church. 
and their deepest theological discussions are with a bunch of sheep. So why them? Maybe it was because God wanted to demonstrate first to the shepherds that his love does not discriminate on the basis of class or wealth or race or social standing. God doesn't discriminate on the basis of intelligence or education or profession or political power or any other adjective that you can ascribe. God doesn't respect kings more than cab drivers and he doesn't respect priests more than pew potatoes. But then again, that's our God. <laughs> because he's kind of indiscriminate that way. Paul makes the same point in his first letter to the Corinthians. And here's what he said. My dear friends, remember what you were when God chose you. The people of this world didn't think that many of you were wise. Only a few of you were in places of power and not many of you came from important families. But God chose the foolish things of this world to put the wise to shame. He chose the weak things of this world to put the powerful to shame. What the world thinks is worthless, useless, and nothing at all is what God used to destroy what the world considers important. God did all this to keep anyone from bragging to him. You are God's children. He sent Jesus Christ to save us and to make us wise, acceptable, and holy. So, if you want to brag, do what the scriptures say and brag about the Lord. Now I imagine church that many nights as the shepherds sat in at least during the winter time those cold and lonely fields they may have looked out over the valley and the villages and saw the lights of homes far away and maybe they heard the faint sound of families and people laughing and maybe they wish they could have been a part of that. And maybe you felt that way too. Maybe you're not one of the pretty people. Maybe you're not particularly wealthy. Maybe you're not particularly powerful or even influential. Maybe you'll never see your name in the newspaper for some extraordinary accomplishment. Maybe you're on the fringes, either socially or religiously, or both. And when you compare your level of religious observance, at least to others, the comparison doesn't stack up very well. Spotty church attendance, infrequent Bible reading, and a very sporadic prayer life. You think that if God even knows you exist, he's probably not very impressed. And if this happens to strike a chord with you, then I've got great news. I've got Terrific news, in fact. The best possible news that you could have heard all day. God loves you. Just like he loved those shepherds. Just like those shepherds were special to him. So special, in fact, that he gave the shepherds the incredible privilege of being the first to hear of Christ's birth. And other than Mary and Joseph, 
the first to lay eyes on the only Son of God. God didn't give those privileges to the Roman Caesar at the time or to the Jewish high priest. He gave that privilege to shepherds, not in spite of who they were, but to whom they belonged. Humble, ordinary people with few opinions about themselves, simple people who were willing to believe what God told them, and when they heard the news, they didn't seek out a bunch of religious professionals for a second opinion. When they were invited to visit Bethlehem to see the newborn Messiah, I don't read where they were terribly worried about who's going to watch the sheep. They didn't get bogged down in debates about how they were going to find this really itty-bitty small baby in this big, big city town. They simply obeyed and went. God likes to use the ordinary so that, kind of like a mirror, His power can be reflected in his creation. And it's true that God didn't send an angel to you or to me with the news of Christ's birth, but he did send us an invitation. And here's what it says in Luke chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. I'm here to announce a great and joyful event that is meant for everybody worldwide. A Savior has been born in David's town. A Savior who is Messiah and Master. Church, do not let the simple yet profound message of Christmas be lost on you this season. God knows you and loves you, even if you're a misfit. Jesus changed the world with 12 of them, and he can change the world with you too. So this season, this day, Tomorrow, know who you belong to and know that he loves you unconditionally. In fact, he loves you so much that even when you hated him, even when you despised him, even when you didn't even think about him, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, whose birth we celebrate tomorrow, to come to this earth to give his life as an atoning sacrifice so that through his sinless life and death and resurrection, we can have life eternal. That's a pretty amazing concept when you think about it. And you think, well, no. I mean, he can forgive me, but how can I live with God? I'm not a righteous person. Well, the Bible says that those who have been baptized into his death and raised to walk in a newness of life are righteous. Does that make me a righteous person? No, because I'm still a sinner. But from God's perspective, when he sees our life, he views it through the lens of his son Jesus, whose atoning blood makes you right with God. And if that's true, what great, great news. And if you don't know this Jesus, then let me tell you more about him. Or let others here tell you more about him. Or if you do know Jesus, it's not a club. Go tell other people. 
It's not some sort of secret where you have to use a special knock here on the door to get into the church building. This is a hospital. It is a place where sick people come to be informed of God's love for them and that there's a cure for their disease and that is eternal death. People can leave the hospital well. Not perfect, but well. So today, as you spend time with family, tomorrow as you spend time with family, please make it a really merry, merry Christmas because we have much for which to be thankful. So as Steve said, he's going to be coming up now to lead us in this next song. So Steve, why don't you advance it to the next slide? Perfect. And then I'm going to take over so that Steve can lead the song and you can see the lyrics and you can see the lyrics on the overhead. Then after that, I'm going to come back and if you have any of those prayer requests, happy to take them. We'll spend a few minutes with them. And depending upon how many requests there are and how much longer I speak, my Christmas gift to you is you get to leave early. Let's stand and let's sing. Father, we're grateful for the love that you've given to us by sending your son Jesus Christ to die for our sins so we might live with you forever. And Father, during this time, we are reminded of the birth of our Savior Jesus Christ. And that 32, 33 years later, he gives his life as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And so the only way that he could give his life is to be given life, which you did through your Holy Spirit. So we're grateful, Father, for that event, and we celebrate it. Help us to be kind and passionate and loving to others, to bring them into our family to help celebrate the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And Father, as you know, life here is not easy. Dennis has certainly been through it. He's had issues with substance abuse, and that's been resolved, but the consequences of that have not, and so he's pursuing his education to get his driver's license back so he can drive wherever he needs to other than just appointments and those kinds of things. So Father, bless him as he goes through that process. And then coupled with his wanting to get the license back is the problem with his neck that he suffered because of work-related accident when he was in the Navy decades ago, and it just continues to persist, and it's just not getting better. So God, help the doctors be insightful and give Dennis some options so that he can get back to where he would like to be and the flexibility he'd like to have and the mobility that he really seeks in his neck. Father, we're mindful of the Dillard's youngest son's best friend. He's part of Deontay and Kenyatta's family and their house burned to the ground. All of their Christmas gifts were destroyed. Certainly Christmas spirit has been dampened. And we wonder how could such tragedies happen on such a happy occasion and we're reminded, God, that life is difficult. And you've never promised that it would be easy. But you did promise that you would be available and you would help. And so, God, we turn to you in prayer to help that family. It's not a happy occasion for them. They have nothing left of what they've accumulated over a lifetime except for the clothes that were on their back when they're fleeing the burning house. God, help others come alongside them and be helpful to give generously to them, to be kind to them, to give them shelter, to give them food, to give them clothes, to help get them back on their feet, Father. It's such a difficult time, and they could really use your comfort and your care. And then, of course, Derek Copeland, he's suffering from both prostate cancer and kidney cancer. And, of course, you know the kidney's going to be removed, but they still have to deal with the prostate cancer. God, whenever we hear about cancer, it frightens us. We don't know exactly what to do, but you know what? You've gifted us with talented men and women that through the use of science and all those kinds of things, you can work through them, Father, to heal people. And so we pray that you'd bring him health and hope, that you would put in his way people 
that could help his medical condition and make him better. And so, God, for these people and for others, we ask your blessing. And as we leave this place, help us to be encouraged. Help us to not keep the birth and life and death of our Savior Jesus Christ a secret, but to share it with others. And Father, during this season, help us to be generous with our time and our resources because there are others living among us who are not as fortunate. Put them in our path so that we can be generous to them. Help us to walk through the next several days with our eyes wide open to see opportunities where we can help and most importantly, opportunities where we can love. So be with us and guide us. Watch over us. Let this be a very blessed and merry Christmas. And it's through your son who gave us Christmas to begin with, we pray, amen.